Hello? Oh, excellent. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this event organized by the Architects Council of Europe and funded by um, uh, DG Culture as part of the Creative Europe program. Um, the event is called Making Sustainable Architecture Work. Um, and uh, we've just had an amazing walk through the tour and taxis complex, um, looking at a sustainable retrofit in the center or near the center of Brussels, which was, it, it was really a, a, a rich and wonderful experience to see such excellent investment and the realization of um, some of the green ambitions um, so close to the heart of Brussels. Um, we, so we're living through interesting times. Um, I remember a, a few years back, um, we the, the the different ministries uh, were, you know, when you want when you went to meet and talk and discuss the the uh, the urgency of the the crisis, we would be meeting with separate ministries. And now, I think what's amazing is that everyone is really working together all the time, um, and we have. And we're very lucky to have this the, an excellent team of experts from the Commission with us today to be able to um, ask them about um, what is uh, coming in terms of legislation, in terms of initiatives, how things have progressed over the last year or so. There is... Closer into the microphone. Is this better? <laughs> Um, there has been a huge amount of development uh, in, in the EU Bauhaus movement. Levels have been rolled out and is uh, publicly available. Um, there is uh, the EPBD, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, is under review. And it, uh, quite unbelievably, the um, or not so unbelievably, but rather inspiringly, the, uh, the Building Performance Institute of Europe uh, has just released their... Um, uh, buildings climate tracker showing that we still have a long way to go uh, with improving the amount of resources we use to create wonderful places, which is really the ambition of all architects. And we do believe very strongly that architecture can be transformative um, and it's quite essential to this journey to net zero. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to see so many familiar places, he, uh, faces here today. With many of you, we were working together really hard um, on the World GBC's Whole Life Carbon Roadmap document, as, as well as the, the response to the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Um, and uh, yeah, so we are, uh, I'm really very curious to find out today um, how some of these uh, developments that are influencing the way in which or, or your focus areas, your priorities, and also in, in, in the context of the current energy crisis, how do these priorities change? But before we launch, launch into our debate, I would like you to introduce you to my co-chair, Peter Andreas Satrup from the Danish uh, Association of Architectural Practices. And he's going to talk um, a little bit about how we're trying to capture architectural quality in the and as well as performance together and and how that can lead to transformative interventions in the sector over to you peter Andre. thank you uh expectations are high i i, <laughs> I get it um uh, i'll just present a, a little bit uh, a few frameworks of thought uh, for how we can capture and work with architectural quality as a way to uh, actually promote and create value to society and of course also to individuals. Uh, please change. Uh, we in Denmark and I suppose architects everywhere in Europe have really been excited about the new European Bauhaus initiative and also is something where, where the emphasis and put on the cultural aspect of sustainability in a really strong uh, fashion because um, Culture is strategy is a bon mot in, in many instances, and culture is really a, a question of, of everyday practices of what we do in our everyday lives. And how can we change that? How can we change that behavior? And how do we think about this in, 
terms of methods, but also in terms of, of, of policies. So what are the uh, potential policy implications of the new European Bauhaus? Uh, that's a very exciting uh, thing. Uh, it also raises the question that uh, cultural values, is that something fluffy, uh, difficult to handle, or can we actually be more precise about it? and even establish some ways of working with it or some ways of um, assessing, uh, evaluating, uh, creating cultural value. Uh, so I'd like to offer just a few uh, ideas or frameworks that we've been working with in the uh, Danish Association of Architects, and maybe that can be a point of departure for future work here. Uh, please change. Next. Uh, we're really excited about the policy and frameworks thing because it is a way to establish markets. If we really want to, to, to change uh, behavior, we, the policy can also have uh, market implications. If you have a policy, you have to define some problems to be solved, and that is where the, the services of designers and architects come in. Please change. Uh, We've also been excited about the levels framework. We think it's really good to have a common denominator for the way that we assess sustainability in, in, in the built environment, but there's of course an absence of cultural aspects in the levels framework. So maybe that's something we can build together with the uh, new European Bauhaus initiative, looking at what are the experiences from practice and how can we actually create some frameworks for uh, a way of, of, of working with value in the built environment. Please change. Uh, we also have the sustainable development goals. That's a communication framework, but it's also an assessment framework that really covers so many aspects of life on this planet. And we have given ourselves 10 years to accomplish uh, these goals. So I think we should keep that in mind. Please change. Uh, when it comes to architectural values, uh, I think a way of talking about values in sort of the cultural senses uh, looking back at what is the shared history we carry with us. And uh, Vitruvius, I mean, 2,000 years ago, called, talked about virtues. But virtues is, in a sense, uh, uh, a blend of e ethics and aesthetics. So I think that this is also a way we can talk about sustainability. In this framework is, is, uh, uh, that we've developed with the, uh, the uh, Danish Green Building Council, it's based on the DTNB sustainability certification. We have an assessment of, of architectural value based on the uh, Vitruvian virtues, and how do we recognize that at various scales of architecture? Uh, the site, the building shape, or the environment's shape, and the detailing. And each of these can be quite precisely discussed and assessed. I mean, after all, we practice this in architects and education, you know, so why couldn't we uh, assess the quality uh, of, of any built environment based on our shared space, our, our professional educational experience? Please change. Uh, so the question of value is, is interesting because it's both a cultural aspect, you know, what is it that we appreciate, but it's also how do we measure it? Value is also, you know, putting measures to things. And the problem is that in the built environment, everybody is obsessed with costs, but what are the benefits? If the benefits aren't measured, if they aren't uh, evaluated, if they're sort of not becoming, um, you know, manifest, tangible, then they happen to uh, evaporate from the business models that we apply when we build. And you know that uh, it's funny for a phenomenon like architecture that can last for several hundred years. You know, this is a, an example of a building really with a long lifespan uh, getting reinvented, you know, over and over. We have business models that are you know, like five years, uh, fire and forget, you know, you just built to sell and then nobody cares what happens, you know, or, is, or that problem is left from the developer to the users. Uh, so the business models, so to speak, have to be uh, triple bottom line, economic, uh, environmental, social, and we have to think of this with really long term, multiple uh, generations of, of users in mind. Please change. So if you apply a life cycle perspective to the, the, the value, I mean, we should go from the, you know, economics of construction to life cycle costing. That's sort of the uh, first four bubbles. It costs next to nothing to establish an idea, you know, a brief for a, for a task. It costs absolutely nothing to design, you know, compared to what it costs to construct. But then with the life cycle of building, I mean, costs will 
of, of, of operation, maintenance, future adaptation, and so on. That's an entire range, different range of economy. But what we don't look at is how does this affect the use of, the, of this building? Imagine a hospital. What happens if you can if you can reduce the operational costs? What happens if you can actually increase the well-being of, of the patients? A hospital is the most crazy business model of all in architecture because the operational cost for one year of a hospital can equate, you know, the entire construction cost. So this can be, in the case of, 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 of hospitals, you know, a very short term uh, equation. Of course, we don't have the precise values for this, but I think we should keep this in, in mind as an intellectual idea and also a way of thinking about the impacts of architecture, because most of this is actually done by the way you frame the design problem and how you actually develop strategies, solutions to deal with that. That will enable the future users of the building to, uh, to pursue uh, the practices, the, uh, the quality of life that they wish. Please change. Yeah, next. There you go. Uh, just a simple case. Uh, uh, one back, please. This is a social housing project in uh, Copenhagen. It's uh, built by uh, Van, or it's designed by Van Kunsten engineers for a social housing uh, association (KAB). And um, the idea was to enable uh, the users to actually maintain the building themselves and create communities around the maintenance. And uh, it's prefab construction, uh, timber, stick build. And they were able to reduce the carbon emissions by 70% just by changing building technology and uh, reducing maintenance costs. And this is not more expensive. It's actually cheaper, so they can actually save 20% of the rent comparing to traditional uh, social housing projects. And it comes with a very high satisfaction among the users. So they do did surveys. And people are very confident and have a good uh, experience that they have a very good uh, sense of, of neighborship uh, in this place because they actually share, well, not the burden, but the great tasks of, uh, of uh, keeping this a really nice place. Please shift. And I think that maybe one takeaway from that process is that sustainability is not expensive, which many will have you believe. It's, it's really a matter of the intelligence that you invest in the process. Um, so how do we actually uh, create, uh, how, can, how can we manifest these values? Um, there are ways that you can measure uh, social values, environmental values, economic values in more holistic terms. And it's all based on how do you actually engage with the users? Because it is a question of what do the users really experience? All value is really a question of how are things perceived and are you participating in this, in, in this development process? And that sort of have an impact on how you assess and experience uh, value in this environment. So you can actually establish methodologies that are pretty clear, but of course, based on things that you should do in an ideal process and that will always uh, need to meet the reality you know, in, in, in specific ways. Please change. So uh, getting back to the uh, new European Bauhaus and the idea of, of creating a built environment that's beautiful, sustainable together, I think that calls uh, for a new way of thinking uh, policies and also thinking about methods and approaches and processes, uh, and not just looking at uh, you know buildings as things that have a technical performance, but also that have a social performance, and even a economic uh, uh, performance that uh, that that is you know more interesting than just the property property price, because of the implications on social life. Please change. And when we do that, we have to recognize that we are in a situation of crisis. I mean, we are overshooting the planetary boundaries. Uh, we have a, a rampant biodiversity loss crisis. We have a climate crisis that is uh, getting problematic, more and more problematic by the day. And it is really the land conversion issues, the way that we build cities and the way that we actually harvest materials, resources, and so on from the natural uh, biosphere. 
all the while that we seek to improve our societies. That's sort of the inner circle of the donut economy, whereas the outer circle, circle is the planetary boundaries for, for resources. Um, please change. So we should keep that in mind uh, when we talk about the, the, the Bauhaus, that this is actually a very short period of time that we have to implement an entirely different way of dealing with the uh, uh, built environment and the way that creates societies. And we have to think with the, uh, this uh, figure that is Bill Reed, one of the founders of the US Green Building Council, that we need to move forward to, uh, to, to not understanding green architecture as something which is less damaging, but something that is really recreating some of the losses uh, of quality in the uh, natural environment. So a regenerative practice, please change. Uh, we were really excited in uh, Denmark uh, about the uh, new European Bauhaus. So we've got one of these uh, lighthouse pro uh, projects and we think we're thinking of the planetary boundaries and how to create processes for that and also implement some of the frameworks here and maybe come up with some ideas of how the, the new European Bauhaus can be translated into future methodologies that can be applied in policy making. Please change. Uh, so the question is really how can we, you know, all these frameworks, all these ideas, all these ways of working that are sort of related to the question of quality and processes and, you know, engaging in the cultural aspects of the built environment and creating transformative experiences. Uh, how do we inter integrate these in policies that enable the market to really create the solutions? I think that is one of the questions that I would really like to discuss today. Thank you. So thank you so much, Peter Andreas. You can see that for architects, the new European Bauhaus is, is really truly transformative. Um, and it, it suddenly gives us the space to think and work and reimagine the way in which we live. The, the second challenge is how do we then construct these amazing spaces with less resources? So in this context, I wondered if I could ask each of you to say something uh, briefly about yourselves and how is the new European Bauhaus changing or influencing the way in which we, you work uh, and, and your focus um, areas and, um, and, and whether there is, um, so, uh, you know, what is it that, that is concerning you most at the moment? Um, would you like to start? Josefina. Sure, yeah. So I am Josefina Lindlum and I work at DG Environment for the European Commission. And I've been working on this uh, topic of sustainable buildings for um, 11 years now. I'm not an architect myself, so you have to be patient with me when it comes to the to those details, but uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, primarily throughout those years, I've been working on the how to assess the performance uh, of a building throughout its full life cycle, but then focusing on the environmental performance. So I have no particular uh, background in the in the other two pillars of the uh, of Bauhaus of the social and the, and the beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so I have been involved in developing levels and uh, we published levels back in 2020 and since then we have been working to develop different um, supporting tools you could say so that it makes it easier for anyone who's interested in levels to use it, it can be the e-learning uh, it can be a web-based calculation tool and, and other things um, and now more recently we are also working on um, using levels as a basis to bring in these kinds of life cycle performances into different kinds of policy initiatives. So that can be sustainable finance, for example, the taxonomy that you're aware of. Um, importantly, the construction product regulation and the energy performance of buildings directive. So by having these levels, we are able to, to broaden the concept from 
from where we used to be, um, but it's true that we're not broadening it to the same extent as, as what the new European Bauhaus suggests. Um, a lot of my time now is also spent on how do we bring in whole life carbon uh, into, into policy. I said just that we were using levels and some of the indicators to bring in life cycle thinking into policy and, and we are doing that. Um, but so far we're only talking about how important it is uh, to assess and report on those aspects, but we are not talking about any kind of benchmarks or limit values. So uh, we will be working together with lots of colleagues in the Commission and also external experts uh, work to uh, try to set a roadmap for that as well, where we think we need to, to be at different points in time to reach our climate goals in the end. So that's what I'm busy with. Thanks, Josefina. I wonder, Vera, if you would like to give us a, a little bit of an insight into, into your role and, um, and, and what keeps you busy just now? Uh, my name is Vera. I'm part of the New European Bauhaus team. I'm one of the first three members. <laughs> it's now, the initiative is now two years old. <clears throat> so for Bauhaus uh, timeline, I go way back. But I was just remembering uh, almost 20 years ago, I'm not an architect, I'm a designer. I was working on uh, grey water systems in a sustainable design office, which was then very much a niche topic. And I um, since then specialized in participatory processes. And I worked, for example, in a local government um, uh, to initiate participatory uh, processes uh, for new building concepts. And that has also been my role in the new European Bauhaus because I was the one who collected all the input that people gave in the beginning uh, in the initiative. So the more than 2000 um, stories that we collected, the free form, the papers that we got, we read everything and we collected and we analyzed it. And um, after that, I became responsible for um, analyzing all the incoming materials. So from the price that we did in the past two years, but also the first outcomes of the calls that we have, the lighthouse demonstrators, as far as they were there. Um, so my role was to collect input and also based on that, come up with a kind of guidance, a compass is what we uh, call it. And that will come out next month. We've been working very closely uh, with with Josefina, uh, also with DigiGrow, um, to uh, see how we could give a bit more guidance on what the European Bauhaus actually means. Thank you, that's really helpful. That's a really helpful introduction, thank you. Thibault. Thank you very much. And indeed, it would be really, really useful to have your, your guidance uh, whenever it, it, it's really mature enough. Um, so on my side, I'm, I'm Thibault Roy, I work in DG Energy. Um, so at, at the moment really involved with the uh, revision uh, of the EPBD, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. So um, the main focus of the EPBD obviously is really uh, energy use and energy savings. So that's really what the, the, the main, the core task of uh, this legis legislation is. Um, so with the recast proposal that we adopted in December, um, we're really aiming at targeting what we call the, the worst performing buildings in terms of energy consumption. So those with an energy performance certificate, uh, typically G or F or equivalent, depending on, on the member states, uh, of course. Um, and we, we really aim at doing that for three main reasons. Um, first is obviously the impact on energy poverty. Uh, but also how people just uh, feel in those buildings because um, you mentioned uh, also uh, peter the the, the 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 relation with the, the co-benefits or co-harms of living in in uh, those worst performing buildings in terms of leaks um and and mold and all those things that you don't want to have in your building um so that's really a key focus uh, area of the proposal uh, we want to renovate, to, to re-get those buildings into being renovated, hopefully up to a deep renovation level. And for that, we propose what we call minimum energy performance standards, uh, so MEPS. 
Um, at the same time, we are, are really trying not only to deepen, if I can say, the, the efforts in terms of energy savings, but also to address the other, um, really the other key issues around buildings and people living in buildings. And that includes um, obviously uh, not only the, the impact of the energy use in the building on an operational daily basis, uh, but also as mentioned by, by uh, Josefina, uh, more globally, the, the, the whole life cycle uh, impact of those buildings. And so to do so, um, we really want to, to start this process uh, in the PBD uh, by proposing um, for new buildings because they will still be there in 2050 and they really have to show the way because there, there is only limited space for them um, to, to uh, require those buildings uh, to report on their uh, whole life cycle uh, emissions. We call it uh, global warming potential um, based on, on the levels of um, methodology which, is, uh, which colleagues are, are working on uh, as well. Um, now maybe one last word about um, the common language. Uh, we are trying to really uh, develop a common understanding of, of what a uh, real performance building would be based typically on uh, a rescaling and harmonization of energy performance certificates, so the EPCs. So that's another, um, let's say, proposal in the recast. Um, but of course, we would really uh, be keen to see how we can uh, work hand in hand with, um, in particular, the, the New European Bauhaus uh, label, uh, which would really um, sanction or uh, promote buildings, not only um, perf energy performance, but also beauty and, uh, and, and inclusiveness. So lots of uh, ambitions. Now the question is really how, we, how do we set it right? Thanks, Timo. That's a really comprehensive intro and we'll have lots of questions to follow up. Philip. Yes, uh, hi everybody, and uh, it's great to be <clears throat> here. I'm actually an architect myself, or I used to work as an architect before I joined the commission about eight years ago. Uh, so it's, it's wonderful to be uh, amongst uh, friends. Um, so I'm working in DG Grow, which is the Directorate General for the Single Market and Industry. So we're very much, um, we have the industry and uh, the industrial ecosystem at heart and the, the industry ecosystem uh, of construction is not just a buzzword, it actually has a very precise definition uh, in the industrial strategy. But um, I think when it comes to architects, you are really in a unique leadership position because you are the designers of our world. Um, we, all of us, uh, we're told spend an average of something like 85% or more of our time in buildings. So you really are designing, you know, our everyday environment. Um, so your um, uh, influence is huge when it comes to uh, the sustainability of that environment. Um, so what we try and do in, in DG Grow is, is make sure that the industry, including architects, have the tools that they need to design great buildings and, and infrastructure um, that is um, uh, sustainable and um, uh, among those tools when it comes to the life cycle performance is to have good data. Um, we are encouraging more and more use of, of digital tools like BIM uh, and in order to have good data in BIM you need uh, good data coming from construction products that you use to put together and make a building. And that's why at the moment we have um, a proposal to revise the construction products regulation, uh, which would introduce for the first time environmental requirements for construction products and requirements for them to have digital product data. So some of them already have these EPDs, environmental product declarations, but they're not harmonized at the moment. So uh, the idea would be to have a harmonized system of this uh, aligned with the EN standards, the European standards. And then that data is what would be used uh, to carry out a life cycle assessment using the levels in order to meet the requirements of the energy performance of buildings directive uh, to declare the life cycle performance. So all of these um, pieces of legislation are actually working together. So we're, we're, we've all been working together across the Commission coordinating all of this. And the other thing we're doing at the moment in, in DG Grow is we're preparing 
um, a transition pathway for construction. And uh, this is um, along with the other industry ecosystems. There are 14 of them in the industrial strategy. So construction is one of the, the biggest. And um, we are uh, developing this transition pathway for the green and digital transition and also resilience. So um, uh, I guess green transition is fairly obvious what that does. It's, it's encouraging the circular economy. It's encouraging lower life cycle emissions of construction and also um, uh, things like renovation and energy performance, which are, you know, construction is an enabler. The digital transition is an enabler of that as well uh, with the digital tools. And then the resilience means we need also the skills and the skilled labor and the supply chains and so on to be able to do all of this. Um, so, so that's a, a big piece that we're working on uh, at the moment in in uh, in the commission for construction. Thanks. Brilliant, Philip. And I, I, it's very rare that the, the speaker will start with celebrating architecture and and its power to transform lives. So, thank you for that. Um, the, so, I have a few questions just to start off the discussion, and. One of the things we, um, we, we've been thinking about, obviously, we as architects really like levels because it has a comprehensive approach, um, because um, it's trying to uh, track not just the resources that we use, but also what we achieve with those resources. Um, and also because it tracks, you know, it's aligned to the amount of information and data that's available at critical project stages. Plus, it looks at projects' performance from, conception, from, from conceiving a project all the way to the end of life. And, and all of this we like because it, it allows us to track impacts without pushing those into hitherto unreported um, areas. Um, so the, so we, we're, we're really wondering to what extent um, is this going to underpin, uh, is levels going to underpin forthcoming legislation? What else is on your radar? Do you think levels is going to become a standard? Um, is it, um, you know, also how we have so many indicators always to work to, but what's becoming really interesting for us is how some of these begin to cross cut. So as soon as we bring the value aspect and the cultural aspect, into the equation, we can begin to see how certain indicators about whole life performance have really important implications for social outcomes. Um, is, is that something that you're considering at the moment or working with your colleagues on? This might be one of those questions where the question is much longer than the answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, Judith. <laughs> uh, so first of all, um, yes, the levels consists of a number of, I think it's 16 indicators, all in all. And uh, the one that we certainly have been sort of using the most in order to bring it into as a basis, I should say as a basis in, in different policy initiatives, is the one on whole life carbon, which we have already uh, talked about here. And, and there we see it, uh, as I think I mentioned already in my introduction, in sustainable finance taxonomy, in the <clears throat> energy efficiency directive as a recommendation, and the, of course, in the energy performance of buildings directive. That's, that's really important as it is a mandatory or would be a mandatory requirement then. Um, in, in the case of the EPPD and the energy efficiency directive, of course, we're talking about proposals which are being negotiated so we don't have anything ready yet but that has that has really been i should say very interesting for us to see how we can we can use levels which is indeed a voluntary tool which no one is forced to use uh, but we can sort of use it to, to to bring in these kinds of aspects into policy um, we are currently and i think that philip mentioned that perhaps as well uh, that he's working uh, together with other colleagues on the sustainable finance uh, taxonomy now in relation to circularity, right? And um, <clears throat> and there we have the opportunity to to use a couple of other levels indicators because levels pays a lot of attention to circularity aspects. So that helps us to sort of 
um, not just talk about circularity, but try to, to be a bit more concrete in what we are, how we define a sustainable investment. Um, I think, uh, and also, of course, we have, so that those are the legislative proposals. I would say also that um, when it comes to the construction product regulation, which Philip also mentioned, um, I think Levels has had a, a certain uh, impact there as well. The fact that it is now uh, the, the, draw, uh, the proposal from the Commission is indeed looking at how to make the global warming potential um, mandatory in, the, in one way or the other. <clears throat> but uh, so, so those are our current legislative uh, work, so to say. Then, of course, we are working closely with um, the new European Bauhaus colleagues. Um, there is, uh, as you may, well, we had already mentioned the compass, but there's also the intention to develop a self-assessment tool, which obviously will, will cater for the different pillars of, uh, of Bauhaus, and I'm sure Eva will talk about it, uh, Vera will talk about it more, but uh, we, we would assume also that Levels there will have an important role to play, so that makes a good link. Uh, for, for other works coming, other policy works coming into play, you asked about the social dimension and the beauty dimension. That is not something that uh, we have looked into just yet. I think that is still perhaps more with the our colleagues at the JRC, but I understand that this, this is something that we, we need to go for at the end. Uh, at the same time, of course, I often get the question as well, okay, so you have levels for buildings, when will you have it for, for generally more for construction? And, and when will you have it not just for a building, but for a whole uh, neighborhood? So there are many questions that are coming in, uh, which wants to do more of, of the same. And I think for the time being, perhaps, um, we need to make sure that at levels and the way we use it and the way we can use it, not just on building projects, but in policy, we need to see some that it works and that it's stable. So I think we need to take it step by step. I, 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 was, uh, I was intrigued by, by, by your introduction because I, I just figured out that we actually have some architects and designers who've jumped into policy making or, you know, assisting in policy making and that's actually a designerly practice because it reflects the inherent uh you know political nature of arts architecture and design i mean because we are always talking you know somewhere maybe below the surface about how do we how do we navigate the values and who do we create value for and how and are these values negotiable or what what is it really so i think that uh this this is really interesting i must have made an impression in the um in in, in the group of people working with the new european bauhaus how much traction and attention it got so i think that i was really delighted to hear that you as a designer designed a co-creation process for what is an inherently an instrument of policy making and uh, behavior change, you know, <laughs> at a huge scale, and that this process really uh, created a political uh, involvement and engagement, you know, from the base up, but also top down. Uh, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that experience in your group and your, you know, political, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the political group behind it. How, what, is, what is the impression that it made and how will this enable you as a team to, 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 to really create something uh, that is transformational? In policy making, it's a huge question, sorry, but yeah, that's a very I was just intrigued. Yeah. What okay. are your thoughts? I mean, just as a human being, as a designer, really? Well, when, uh, when the European Bauhaus, when uh, Bauhaus was mentioned in the speech of Ursula von der Leyen two years ago, I was working in the, um, in the Joint Research Center in uh, the Policy Lab, which is the innovation unit of the, of the, of the Joint Research Center. And uh, we heard this word and we, with some architects and designers in our team, we immediately recognized because everybody who has had Bauhaus in their education immediately recognized this word so we thought if there's anything that will happen around this we need to be involved anyhow we but we didn't know 
anything about um, how it would evolve, how it would go. So um, we were actually one, one of the groups who made a plan and we just started with a plan and that evolved inside the European Commission. And then we also got the task, we formed a small uh, unit that actually got to work on it. But from the start, we tried to uh, involve as many colleagues as possible because uh one of the things that the joint research center does it's all the researchers of the european commission they always have to work with many different colleagues from many different fields within the european commission so that i think is one has we tried as much as possible from the start to involve everybody in our process within but also outside which is a huge coordination task and um yeah we were in the beginning with five people, six people, now we're 17. That's uh, already something. Is that a little bit an answer to your question? Sure, I, I think that the, 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 uh, the, the, the reason why I'm asking is that this process, uh, there was a co-creation process in, in the test of levels two, but I think that there's a, there's a huge point in actually having the, the feeling, the real feeling that you contribute, you know, as a, as a citizen, really, I mean, you have the possibility to to really uh, engage with the Bauhaus, and I would wish that we all had that that meaning that that experience, you know, with policy making in, in in every field. So I wonder if there's uh, some food for thought, you know. Uh... Yeah, on, on on that note, Thibault, I'm really wondering about. Um, obviously, our team has done a lot of work on the energy performance of buildings directive, um, and. From the starting point of, of initially that just focusing on energy to actually becoming a much bigger beast, which we often feel it wasn't really intended for, but it's the best thing that we have. So that's what we have to work with. How was that journey for you? And are you happy with, with to, to how far we've got? And what are your hopes with keeping the best bits in? Well, I, first of all, I, I have joined this journey um, not that long ago, so I wouldn't be able to, to trace it down to, to really the, the humble, How long ago? humble beginning. So I, I've been working on the EPBD for one year. And I was it's doing, long enough. <laughs> so I'm not an architect and I was doing state aid before, so really not related. Um, and really a, a field which is really uh, only usually with people who do it for most of their lives and not a lot of, let's say, really bottom-up coordination uh, approach to it. It's really a specialized field. But in terms of the EPBD, I, I think we're really happy about what we put on the table in, in December. Um, it was not a given to have some of those um, new or updated articles. I'm thinking of the uh, minimum energy performance standards, uh, of course. Um, you have opposition from certain spheres um also the the review and harmonization of of the epcs similarly um and then of course on 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 really the whole, whole life cycle um impacts and, and and emissions we're really happy to to have the concept in the pbg um because then of course the co-legislators the parliament and council will take different positions and will find an agreement on what they want in terms of ambition, but at least the, the concept is there. Um, really, the first step is, is in terms of uh, reporting. We also know that it gives a signal to uh, industry to work on, on their methods um, to really when that will come. I don't know if it's already next year with the new EPBD or with a later revision, when those uh, limit values will come through legislation uh, at, at EU level. Just also an aparte that um, this is, of course, an EU directive, which means that uh, member states can, can go further, and some member states are going further in terms of, and, and you know this very well, in terms of uh, whole life cycle um, emission um, requirements. So now in terms of the final outcome, um, we've seen the, the draft report uh, from, from the parliament, really ambitious on basically everything that we propose going further. Um, we are discussing with member states um, who have other um, issues and, and, and really um, questions uh, in terms of, for example, the capacity of the construction sector to deliver 
uh, in terms of rate of renovation, depth of renovation, and then of course, at which level do we set the, the cursor in terms of not only energy performance, but then of course, um, the quality of those materials and how they were generated and how they would be recycled. So lots of question marks from, from, from the council, from the member states. Um, so it's difficult to, to say at this stage uh, what we will uh, achieve on that. But at least the key concepts are, are in the directive, let's say. Oui. open okay uh, VPCs are not harmonized yet mm -hmm. and you have not set the final standards for uh, for the limit up or uh, for zero energy buildings but uh, until 2027 and 2030 that uh, we have the deadlines it's very few years that means that buildings have, have should already started to be renovated especially big uh, Big, uh, public buildings so what if they start or they have started the, the renovations with existing standards and they become uh, when you set when you finally set the uh, the final targets and the harmonization of EBCs from country to country these become outdated what what's what's going on with this because you know, we, we're hearing from the European Union since 2010 or before that uh, we should have some targets like Paris 2020. And I think that very little has happened up to now. I mean, there are a lot of talks and talks, but not really actions. So what's your point on that? Thank you. Can I add a, a, a point to that? So I think one of the things that you may have heard us talk a lot about is the accountability of, for performance. So architects are, are really very keen to see the feedback loop closed between design IED asset ratings and operational ratings. And so what's the likelihood that operational ratings will become mandatory? Sorry, when you mean operational ratings? Um, so, mean... so reporting uh -huh. metered performance will become mandatory yeah. um, in, as part of the EB energy performance certification so um it's a, it's a, it's also a technical it's a very technical question i would say so you're saying that you would favor um the use of metered energy for uh, issuing let's say the the epcs for each building or so okay, for, so just for the to EPCs say, being yeah. so the assets, so the yeah. calculated performance being validated with metered performance, after which uh -huh. you can then continue to report metered performance. So okay. the, this link, so the, one of the reasons why this hasn't been done is because there is a discussion about how you can't reconcile really the calculated mm -hmm. performance, which doesn't look at operational patterns mm -hmm. and such like. Um, so with what you meter because it has occupants and no one's responsible for how many televisions people put into buildings yep. but actually there are existing methodologies yep. for doing that but it's it's been really really hard to get yep. that into the yeah legislation so we, we've had a lot of discussions and in, uh, in particular with, with member states on this because the starting point is that uh, they basically each one of them has a different way to calculate the energy performance so the, the, the energy use of, of, of a building. So uh, start, starting from this, um, we're trying, and, and this is really the, the goal of the, the, the proposed Annex 1 uh, in, 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 in the recast, to bring the, um, those two divergent um, starting points, if I can group them in, in two, calculated energy and metered energy, to try to bring them closer one way or another. And, and indeed, for dedicated building and in a dedicated member state to try to use the best of the two. Um, now we are not uh, forcing member state to use one or the other. Uh, we are, the, the best we can do at this stage is really to, to try to reconcile those, uh, those two, those two um, ways of, of calculating the, the, the building's performance. Um, now in terms of EPCs and, and MEPs so, and the link between the two, um, we believe that uh, the, the, the deadlines um, that we propose uh, for complying with those minimum energy performance standards 
or the, the, the best we can do in terms of ambition uh, while not overheating the, the, the market and not creating situations in which uh, you would have X percent, 50 percent or maybe less of the building stock of, or of the buildings concerned, which by the trigger date 2027 or 2030 or before would actually not be in compliance because then it would be very difficult. Also, you're, you're talking about mainly residential buildings. You don't want to sanction people or, you know, to find them. Uh, in particular, if you take the energy poor for not complying uh, with the standards because those standards were, were, were you know, um, over the top were too ambitious. Um, so we try to, to strike the right balance. It could be a bit, a bit more ambitious, in particular when we talk about the current situation, the repower uh, initiatives. Now, you know, the momentum may be there in terms of also of, of the efforts for, the, for skills, for materials, but it's not like we can ask um, all those buildings in EPC, EFG to, to meet uh, top level ZEB or NZEB level in the next few years. So that's a bit the balancing exercise. Um, very interesting, and thanks for the question. I, I would really like to to invite you know questions. Please interrupt and don't be shy, uh, like Elena just just showed. I mean, it would be great to uh, to have a lively, lively, lively uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Philip, you mentioned um, circularity, and uh, I, I think it's great to hear uh, how much you know uh, we are building. Uh, an infrastructure of data really or enabling the data uh, so that we can uh, sort of do uh, proper calculations of uh, of the circularity or the impacts of, of any given um, you know choice of construction and so on uh, so there's this infrastructure of data aspect but again you know um, as an architect you would recognize that circularity is also a question of design principles and really basic ideas, you know, uh, prolonging, you know, the, the lifetime of a building, you know, or reinventing its identity. That's a more cultural aspect. But I think that these, um, you know, design principles uh, based ways of working with circularity, do they find a way into that way we assess circularity that can be applicable, you know, in levels? as a basic you know common ground conceptually uh, but also be you know uh, exported into the sustainable finance taxonomy how do you i mean there's the data side but there's also a principle side and the principles is again about the value and about you know how do we perceive that and how do we enable that yeah thanks uh, peter for bringing this up because i think um you know we know Renovation of buildings is one of the biggest challenges we've got, but really we also need to be renovating and, and building new buildings in a, uh, a completely different way, really, in future. If we're going to meet our climate targets, it's, it, it really needs a, a circular approach quite fundamentally. So um, this is really a challenge for architects. Um, I had a, a quite an inspiring site visit in Oslo three weeks ago of a completely or almost completely circular uh, building which was an eight-story office building that was extended with a, a completely new part that was 80 percent reused and recycled by weight including structure um, so uh, and this was sourced from 25 buildings across Norway so you can imagine the amount of work the architects would have had uh, instead of just clicking in a catalog and ordering some materials, finding them from 25 demolition sites and um, trying to uh, bring all these different pieces in. And we're talking about things like um, the air handling units, the, the concrete structure, floor slabs that they cut out of an old swimming pool building, the staircases, the tiles, the, you know, everything. It was really quite incredible. Um, so one of our jobs as policymakers is to make that easier because it's far too difficult at the moment to design in a truly circular way. Um, so that, this is one of the reasons why the construction products regulation um, revision is going to make it easier to reuse construction products and also to have remanufactured construction products. Um, this is also in line with the wider product uh, agenda 
of the Commission for all products. We're talking, you know, everything you buy. Um, there's there's uh, another regulation called the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, which is also something new that would make uh, circular products, uh, you know, the norm across everything. So this is really the way we need to be going. Um, uh, renovation is still the priority. Uh, energy efficiency is still a priority, but but circularity is really uh, absolutely crucial. I would say. Any questions from the audience, Michael? No, the Hi, uh, Michael Neves from ECOS, uh, Environmental Coalition on Standards. Um, just uh, referring back to um, your presentation on integrated value assessment and thinking about the EPVD in terms of making the improvements we need. Um, thinking about a practical example of how we try and integrate the other environmental costs, the other social issues, etc. Cost optimality is, is a formula that's really used and could be, I mean, for us, it's almost too transactional, but that's the nature at the moment of that practice of renovation between maybe the occupant and building owner and the renovation and what the payback's going to be and this type of thing. How in, how in practice do we you know, look to integrate that into such a, a key tool in the way that member states will assess compliance with certain renovation requirements and how we look more long-term and broadly at what renovation can bring basically and then slightly linked to that is about you know energy poor and those who maybe cannot uh, renovate their own properties how do we use this integration to shift the burden slightly onto other actors or um, onto you know authorities to try and ensure that the worst performing buildings and those living there can can live in a warm healthy home so it's not just on them i think it requires a different formula if anyone has a response to that, thank you. <laughs> Who wants to uh, <laughs> try? <laughs> well, on cost optimality, the, the current wording um, um, really is a, a, about the economic, uh, purely economic, you know, costs and benefits, right? So you, you know that uh, you, you weigh basically the upfront costs, uh, investment costs, against the, the planned paybacks um, over, I think, a period of 20 years uh, and, and weighted average. So, so it's really purely about um, costs um, against the savings then on, on your energy bill. Now, what we propose with the, with the recast is, um, and what we're suggesting is for member states to, to add other criteria um, to, to, to those um, financial uh, costs and benefits. Um, and of course, the, the goal is, is to bring those co-benefits into the, into the equation, one way or another, into the quantification. And that includes um, co-benefits in terms of health and in terms uh, of uh, impact on the environment and, and climate overall. Now, to do that, uh, you have to find a way to monetize those, those co-benefits. And that's a very big, 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 um, um, can I say, it's, it's really a big endeavor uh, because um, not all, I would say not all of those co-benefits would have an appropriate methodology so that they can be monetized and be part of the, the cost optimality. So it's still uh, something that needs to be um, really matured. Uh, now we think that with the, the, the proposal, the, the legislation is really encouraging that. Um, but we, we also follow, you know, a project that we, we also finance, I think um, it, it includes Horizon or Life Project on this monetization and, and how it can be taken on board. Now on that, typically we would really need to see what's being done at local level and at member states level, uh, because that's also usually how it works. We won't impose something straight away from, from, from Brussels if we don't see that it's working at least somewhere in Europe. So it's a bit the balance to find. I don't know if you want to complement. I mean, I, I could this. say, you know, for the cost optimality in practice, as most of people in the space know, is how cheap, <laughs> I mean, face value, <laughs> I mean, how cheap is it to build? And then the equation more or less stops, right? I mean, that's how you win a tender. 
Uh, so I think that there's, there's, there's a question here, which is about, you know, how can you, you know, just go a little bit beyond the construction economy and, and, and apply lifecycle costing, for instance, as actually uh, a tender instrument? I mean, it's, 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 it's included in, 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 the, in the levels methodology. So, I mean, it is applicable and as, as, a, as a method, I mean, it's fairly, it's fairly, fairly mature. Yeah, I see you're looking at me. <laughs> uh, I agree with you. Um, we are, of course, well, there are two things I'd like to say. First of all, that uh, we have the Energy Efficiency Directive, which has, of course, articles in relation to public procurement. Um, the, the proposal which was um, adopted by the Commission, was it last summer it must have been? I'm losing track here, but 2021, I guess, um, <clears throat> doesn't go as far as perhaps uh, I would have liked it to do. Uh, it, it just recommends uh, a project, uh, a public procurer, to look into um, broader life cycle aspects. Um, we wanted it to go further, but we, we being in this case, <laughs> uh, the levels community, let's say, wanted it to go further, but there in the ED, um, the, the moment wasn't right, I guess. But a few months later, uh, the EPPD, came along and, of course, uh, picked up these, uh, these aspects. Uh, I agree with you that I think, the, in particular, the public procurement would be an excellent way of, of pushing it and not just requiring the assessment on, and reporting of certain, whether it's life cycle costing or, or whole life carbon, but actually start to, to use numbers to, to conclude on, on, on who's, who's winning the bid. Um, in relation to that, I just also want to say that uh, next year, our colleagues at the Joint Research Centre, so other colleagues than, than Vera's team, but uh, uh, people working in Sevilla who are also involved in developing levels, uh, they will have then um, developed new green public procurement criteria, which are based on levels then. So that will... Uh, hopefully uh, give us the opportunity to, to come back uh, to that and see how we can um, include that also in, in different kinds of policy initiatives. It's, it's funny because when you talk about methodologies, it becomes a little bit abstract, right? Because we all know, I suppose, uh, you know, the tips of the trade that uh, life cycle costing, you know, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a specific way of calculating the future cost of maintenance and operation and so on. But you know that the tip of the track or the tip of the trade is really ask the contractors to include 10 years of operation. And then they will make sure that, you know, we don't have any, you know, uh, obsolescence, you know, uh, in five years as is the standard, right? So I think uh, we have an, another question and Elena, maybe still all in the back, the gentleman in the back. I can go on. <clears throat> Apologies. My name is Scholz, Scholz from the Building Performance Institute of Europe. I have a question more to the architects in the room, um, because in my professional life, I came across a number of definitions and, and concepts of value, just to name a few market value, fair value, mortgage value, even natural value. So I was just wondering, how can we peel off this? How can we describe a bit this architectural value? Is to help a bit with also with positioning um, this discussion about architectural value and um, the crude cross optimality calculations. Thank you for the question, <laughs> um, I we have we have it, it's really interesting the question but we, i've just come from a, a whole morning of sitting together with uh, with many uh, me, um, architectural bodies across our member organizations uh, talking about how do they currently reward value i.e how do they recognize architectural quality and this is something that um, i know that the new european bauhaus is trying to do there have been attempts through the the, um, the bauculture movement the davos 8 declaration 
to try and begin to, to capture somehow what quality means and what architectural value is, what, what's the, what do we add? And everybody recognizes, as soon as you walk around this building, you can see what architecture adds. Uh, so why is it so complicated to, to, to get it into contracts? Why is it so complicated to prioritize quality over cost in a, in a basic building contract? I know we put that into green procurement, but it's not a mandatory scheme. In architects feel that in today's age, day and age, quality should be superior to cost when it comes to public procurement. Um, but then we're trying to develop all these indicators to describe quality and we're somehow feel you know there is a danger that we end up with too many indicators but we miss the point so how can we begin to kind of track value through these various assessment frameworks that instead of we having lists we actually end up with knowledge and real value maybe that's a question to vera i just reformatted your question sure <laughs> 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 no, but I it's it's one of the key questions, and I, it's also very difficult to answer. I mean, uh, the I, I have to immediately think about the high quality architecture uh, uh, building blocks, uh, with, which has eight points that are very constructive, clear in, uh, and that has been one of the building blocks for what we are developing right now. But it is, uh, I mean, I don't have the answer. It's a difficult question. We had a whole workshop here in our own Bauhaus Festival in June here in the building, talking about beauty, trying to define from every different uh, different field what beauty actually means. And we can talk on for years and years. Also, no answer, but maybe something. Well, I think, I think you're also pointing to a deficiency in the market and the way we you know, uh, treat re uh, and understand real estate because uh, a building is not obsolete when it sort of falls apart. It's obsolete when it's cost optimal to, you know, tear it down and uh, produce a new building for various reasons. So I think that there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's also a question for regulation, you know, in, in, in the way that, uh, I mean, if, if you really had to uh, figure out the alternative to retrofitting the building would be to produce a new building. If you can look at what is what is the, the carbon footprint, for instance, of retrofitting, energy optimizing versus demol demolition and, and, and building a new building, it can go various ways depending on the architectural strategy that you, you apply to this building. So I think that if when there's a better, when there is a better correlation between, for instance, climate impacts, for instance, circularity, because we want to protect resources, because we don't have an un unlimited number or amount of resources. When you can create correlations in the market through policy making, then you enable all these, uh, you know, hopefully better solutions. I think uh, from a Danish viewpoint, I mean, we've just. Um, introduce them we're getting uh, binding climate, legal climate targets in the building code next year and uh, just <laughs> having that number which is not initially so hard to, uh, to 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 adhere to but just having a threshold value of, to have a building permit has been completely transformational uh, for the entire construction sector everybody knows that they will be measured upon whether they deliver or not and then starts a benign competition among who provide the architectural solutions, but also the construction solutions. So I hope that this is also something uh, that, um, that, that Philip, I mean, do the politicians recognize that you can create markets, really well-functioning markets, once you begin to, to design these, um, you know, these ways that you give encourage, encouragements you set demands, but that also enables encouragements and solutions. Could you please, uh, how is the understanding? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we see uh, in DG Grow the circular economy as a business opportunity. So it's not, um, or it shouldn't be seen as some kind of, uh, uh, something that's esoteric or just done for the planet. It's really a, an opportunity for the industry um, to, um, to work in a different way and to, and to create new business. Um, so, uh, you know, there are many opportunities with, uh, say, re remanufacturing um, products and, and so on. And um, uh, 
making better creative use of the built environment we already have because you know most of it's still going to be here so we're going to have a lot more emphasis perhaps on um, renovation and refurbishment and, and extension of buildings rather than knocking them down hopefully um, and this is why we managed to get in the energy efficiency directive by the way um, uh, in the uh, requirement in there to renovate three percent of public buildings per year um, there, there's a discouragement to demolish uh, to meet that target um, by doing a life cycle assessment compared to uh, other renovation compared to a demolition and reconstruction so um, and of course uh, there, uh, you know, from the point of view of architects or the industry, whether you demolish and reconstruct or you renovate the building, it's still it's still a business opportunity. But one of them is much more sustainable than the other. Um, so we we can use policies to steer um, the right way. Um, that's basically what we're trying to do. And uh, given the uh, the the, the uh, you know rise in energy prices, I think that maybe I mean in in, in your political environment. Isn't there some sort of sadness about the missed opportunity of really gearing up the uh, the retrofitting aspect of the green transition? I mean, how much could we? I mean, how much better could we have been situated if this has started? How you know, expensive does it getting have to traction be? twenty ten years ago? Um, totally. I mean, we we and that's also. Uh, I mean, of course, we recognize all the negative consequences on on citizens um, because of those high energy prices. But at the same time, I think that the the the, really the the we 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 do believe that the solutions that we've been promoting for for years, but they've been the, the uptake has been quite slow. Now we just need to accelerate on those. So it's not like we need to change, you know, our policy angle in terms of um, renovating our buildings or having higher um, performance requirements also for new buildings um, on the whole life cycle. But we we really need to accelerate on this now. To do that, we have already, of course, published our Fit for 55 proposals. So it's not like we want to replace the whole package, which was already a very um, comprehensive package of policies with, with a new one. Uh, we believe that we have to, to build on, on this package. But then uh, what we've been doing is really um, suggest to member states, uh, suggest to the co-legislators, to seize, uh, to recognize that because they are still negotiating on, on most of those proposals, that they should go one step further. Um, to take the EPBD, so to, to really to speak about buildings, um, we have dedicated wording in, in, in a dedicated communication that we adopted, the EU Safe Energy communication, in which we invite the co-legislators to um, to, to go one step further in terms of um, phasing out fossil fuel boilers, for example, or implementing national minimum energy performance standards, um, or updated indeed their requirements for major renovations. So quite a, quite a few um, proposals on which we believe that they, they really have a, a role to play. So now that's really on the medium to long term. There is the, the short term dimension, what the, the savings that we can already deliver for this winter, let's say, and this will be a bit more difficult to do it through legislation because of the uh, inertia, of course. Um, but for this, we, we really uh, call on behavioral and communication um, measures, let's say, uh, to be rolled out by member states, by local authorities, really ask people whether they have checked uh, their draft proofing, whether they uh, could set the, 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 the heating temperature a bit lower in rooms that they don't really use. So that's maybe the, the, the second dimension, but the, the first to address in, in the short term. Sorry. <laughs> the voice with the microphone behind you so uh, just jumping in on, on this exact point philip you mentioned the um superior environmental performance of renovation and we've been talking about integrating certain values into the assessment but for us at the moment a big gap is there's no kind of embodied carbon check on renovation so the renovation wave is going to be a huge outlay of materials um not all of them are you know super low carbon of course so 
whole life carbon assessments to help you know optimize and design better when we're renovating we think is key to kind of guiding overall climate action and then also you'll see how much better on a big scale renovation is compared to new buildings in pursuing that high energy performance low impact operation levels that we that we want to see so i don't know if there are any comments on how important that's going to be i think in the next decade and what we can do about it already um, for us, it's a, it's a big priority that we need to to see, and it would be really helpful if EPBD helped, you know, introduce that in the in the kind of medium term at least. Um, yes, uh, I think it's a very valid point. Um, you know, renovation is the biggest challenge, and and the volume of renovations that is coming uh, means that we need to do that in a resource efficient way. Um, we're not ignoring the fact it's it's very much written into the renovation wave strategy already and that's partly you know that that um, came before all of these uh, revision proposals so it really inspired a lot of the uh, of this policy uh, making that's that's happened since the renovation wave came out um, I think that there's though uh, the that there are differences across Europe in capacity of the industry to carry out life cycle analysis. Um, there are areas of Europe where it's already familiar. So countries like Denmark and, and so on are, are rapidly um, building capacity in that. And then there are other countries where this is quite new. Um, so I think the, the way these policies have been formed at the moment, at least at the EU level, is to try and get uh, be as ambitious as we can for the moment. Um, but that doesn't stop at least, uh, you know, some member states are going ahead with more ambitious policies on um, life cycle assessment, especially some of the Nordic countries, but also we've seen France and, and others are also talking about it at national level. Um, so, uh, you know, they are able to go further. Um, uh, and uh, we need to push, we need to keep pushing, but um, there's only so far that we can push um, you know, realistically, uh, you know, because we are um, you know, under, you know, we have a huge learning curve for the industry and for uh, national and, and local policy makers as well, as well as uh, ourselves. You know, this is a relatively new subject in policy terms. I could say, you know, just from, from our experience in Denmark, it means, again, uh, having a policy, having threshold values, creates a market and it creates an incentive to really create those competences. We as an organization are just helping our members. I mean, a lot of the smaller our companies don't have specialists doing life cycle assessment, uh, but it's really no rocket science and everybody can learn this in a couple of days. Practicing, you know, the theory is relatively simple. Uh, the tools are in the market. Uh, so it's a it's, it's a question of building familiarity and you can do that in a relatively short period. So I think this, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's also a question of somebody having the political courage to say, well, I mean, now here's the roadmap and this uh, creates the incentive. And I think that uh, at least looking from our experience, it, it is truly transformational and you would be, I'm, I am personally uh, quite surprised how rapidly you could see a change of an entire industry. Could I just add to that as well that um, uh, I think the only country that I'm aware of which is about, which is sort of on the verge of starting to include or at least considering including uh, existing buildings rather soon in the legislation is Sweden. Um, they have since, is it since January this year or January last year? And I get a bit confused. Um, they already have a requirement to assess and report on whole life carbon right they have these climate declarations as they call them but they don't work with with benchmarks or limit values which they had initially planned to put in by 2027 and also by starting to look at at renovation of existing buildings by 2027 but the last contact i had with them was that they think of doing this for 2025 now because they it's sort of almost like a demand from the sector itself they they want their benchmarks they want their limit values and they want to go ahead so i think it's um the route has been a bit different to the danish one because um you you came 
Sweden was earlier to ask for the uh, or to require uh, the number of whole life carbon, but Denmark sort of skipped that stage and went straight ahead for, for the for the limit values. But in both cases, I have the feeling that the the, um, the, the reaction has been very much the same. That the sector really is is jumping on this wagon and they want things to happen. So yeah, I think, uh, and actually I wanted to say that a bit earlier as well, uh, considering the fact that the EPPD proposal now is taking um, sort of a, a broader um, scope than what it used to. Um, it is for sure, uh, partly because uh, we in the commission thought it was important, uh, but I really think that a big part of the sector pushed us to think that it was important. So, yeah, I think the sector can be very important uh, to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 um, to make us change. Uh, I wanted to state something regarding what we've been talking about earlier and what uh, Uncle Data said that you cannot define beauty. Actually, in architecture, you can't define beauty because it is based on very strict rules. Uh, when you see a, a very good building, uh, you see Parthenon, for example, which is selling for the last 2,000 and a half years. And you say, why? Because it is based on very strict rules of geometry, of symmetry, and of other things that I cannot explain right now. I'm from Greece. So, uh, there are specific rules, even if you are talking about deconstruction or if you're talking about symmetrical buildings. And I think that we should encounter architecture into all this movement of retrofits and for, of uh, uh, new buildings, because architecture is joining technical, uh, engineering, and social, because we are designing about human beings. So. Human beings are going to be the uh, the habitats of these buildings we're doing now, and I cannot see very much the role of architecture in all these legislations you're doing in EU and stuff. So, yes, you can count on it is something that is you can you can describe. Um, I agree with you, and I don't agree with you. <laughs> I, I agree that uh, I think one of the uh, pe people in the audience said it before, you always feel it when you're in a good building. You always feel when the proportions are right. You always feel what uh, when something feels good, when you have well-being, when uh, and it's, uh, but it's difficult. I think we had a lot of discussions to put it in measures or to put it in rules or to put it in strict uh, um, measurements, like you said. Uh, we've been talking, for example, more on the philosophical side about Carlos, about uh, um, uh, being good, uh, and then you talk about morality. There's a whole world that you can discuss if you start talking about beauty. But what we now defined as one of the key elements for now, but uh, next month when this compass will come out, which is the first step only towards a real debate, maybe, is um, that we talk about quality of an experience, because it's the experience that makes, makes you feel what the building is that needs to be defined. And if you can define that as one of the elements, and that is something that you can actually measure in science, uh, then that you can already have one step towards uh, measuring be beautiful or uh, a quality. But we will probably keep uh, disagreeing if I see your face. <laughs> So I'm aware that there are some questions from the online audience as well, and no, no questions from the online audience. The, I, I wanted to just give you an, an, a slight twist on that. In, in the development of the plethora of indicators that we are looking at, we were discussing with Peter Andreas this morning um, that in, the, in, in collecting case studies, we're, we have been desperately trying to collect case studies of buildings that are really inspiring architecturally and perform. And it's not easy. I spent five years collecting them, correcting seven for my book. It's energy people buildings. <laughs> can, 
can access it online, it's very hard to get that, those examples. But one of the things that we both found in the course of this exercise was that there were some commonalities. So Peter Andreas was saying that the buildings that he's looked at, they all had to have good documentation about certain aspects of performance that are really easy to measure. Uh, we found that the buildings that were targeting operational performance or performance in use, and it was foreseen that those things will be checked once the building is in operation. The occupants will be asked how they feel in the building. It's not, let, it, it, it's not about how much they have, they have to do, it's just the fact that the feedback process is implicit. The project that had uh, prioritized quality uh, over cost in the, in the procurement. So there are some of these levers that are actually really powerful that can be procedural and not quantitative or qualitative and not about how much or how little. Um, and maybe it's worth looking at these so-called indicators and just see the, some of the cross-cutting among them and, and the, the secondary benefits and what are big levers and what are le smaller levers to see what we can achieve with less. No, go yeah, ahead. Please, no, no, no. Well, I, 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 yes, I think, and that's, I think, but then I, it's a different, uh, I think one of the attractions of the new European Bauhaus in general has been that this beauty aspect comes in. So I think a lot of people are actually engaged with us because that is, and I think we did not finish this discussion. Uh, we just started it and i think developing a language together on what this could be i think it's also part of the answer it's the difficult answer because the easy answer would be yes we have indicators or yes we have the uh, i mean we are working on something but that takes time before you actually develop something but any tip is welcome so I wonder, uh, just a simple question to all of you, uh, whom of you, I mean, how do you feel about this space? Is it nice? Is it nice? A yeah, a bit hot. <laughs> Who thinks it's not nice? You didn't raise your hand. You put up with the hot <laughs> because it's nice. It's a... Okay, no, it's a vote. <laughs> Who thinks this space, space is nice? It's nice. Okay, most of you think it's nice. Uh, and I, you know, you could ask that question to anybody, you know. But you see, what's interesting is that it's all, everyone, pretty much majority people agree it's hot, but people actually put up with it being hot because it's nice. There is a, it's a secondary. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, occupants and, and, and how course, we design I mean, for that. Quite a lot of you really are matters. architects who you also have a, you know, a professional opinion about what is it that you experience. Or because and, maybe because we also are, are in the current times or most of the time living in cold buildings. So I'm actually very happy to be in a warm building just to heat up a bit, you know. And also because if the conversation is really interesting, then people will put up with being a bit hot to But the, but the so thing is... you can is, compliment yourselves. But the thing is, I mean, what I just did was a simple measurement of, you know, how do you feel about this? And you can ask, I mean, that's universal. We just use our bodies, you know, to register. I mean, do you like it? Do you not? And then we have a professional language for it, and we also can recognize, well, I mean, actually, the, uh, the, the, the bricks, the exposed brick, they both tell a story about the original stock structure of that, and so does the steel. But the brick also conditions the acoustic environment that is not so bad, com considering that this is a big space, and I mean, some of the surfaces are hard and so on. So we can actually quite easily pinpoint the principles at play that condition this experience. And that's what, you know, that's why we hopefully <laughs> are good designers that we can recognize and, and, and use the, these principles. But the point is that everybody can recognize value and it can be measured as easily as you ask people what they feel about it. Okay, the gentleman first, and then your question, please. Yes, the gentleman is also architect, Peter Benimska. I am former master architect of the European Commission. And now I'm honorary member of one of uh, one of official partners of NEP in Slovakia, which is Manifest 2020. So coming back to your question, I understand that uh, economists at other profession, they will need uh, a value, exact value and numbers and indicators. But for beauty, uh, already discussion is going on in this way. What I wanted to say is some 
10 minutes ago, uh, that, uh, that uh, it's a question of opinion. You could have a group of experts, they give an opinion if it is good or nice or not. You could have a public uh, meaning if it is nice or not. Uh, the one of very well-known examples are uh, the, 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 in Paris, Eiffel Tower, Tower of, of Eiffel, and uh, that also public opinion change. And I think that our, our role of architects is to be a leader to influence also public opinion and to evaluate the beauty. So for me, it's, let's say, two thirds of, of experts meaning and one third of public uh, voting or something like this. So majority for experts, for architects, designers, because we have to, to, to be in the lead. And just one mention, I want just to mention that, uh, it is difficult to measure beauty, but it's the same difficulty as to measure the functionality of the building. To have the buildings, there are more functional, less functional, and also to evaluate this, and this would be a very important indicator for levels or other, 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 other systems. So functionality and beauty, both of them are very hard to evaluate by points. It's, it's, it's a very nice comment from you. Thank you so much. And I, I actually wonder whether it, it resonates with the comment before that sometimes what matters is that you ask. And actually that. It's going to, I was really just going to um, respond in a similar way that it's one thing to ask the opinion of an existing building because you can everybody has a gut reaction the problem is with a lot of projects is you're based on drawings and uh, cgis and that's really really hard and even professional planners i've worked in local government local planners find it very hard to envisage from um, before buildings are built or neighborhoods are constructed what it's actually going to feel like and uh, that, that's the advantage for retrofit, I guess, is that you've got the building there to start with. But it was just really a reaction to that. Thank you. No, I, thank you for that comment. I guess, unless somebody wants to respond to that, we're, we're really reaching the end of the session. And um, I just wondered whether we could just ask our guest speakers to maybe just say very briefly, if, if you could bring in one thing, in the next few months as a legislative change, what would that be? <laughs> yes, it was based on impact assessments and consultations and uh, it reflects the, really all the opinions uh, from the notes, but I, I would say that um, on my side, if should start. Um, Are you saying, Thibault, that all the things that we've asked you to add to the legislation, you're not going to want? <laughs> it was perfect when it was adopted. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, we, 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 we're really pushing for that, actually. And now we have discussions uh, on the EPBD with the, I mean, it's the parliament and then the council on their respective sides, but they are consulting us. And we are really trying to push for, for, for those repower related uh, amendments to higher ambitions overall. Um, what I would what I would really love in the next few few years is for potential future homeowners, um, you know, for example, when they go they when they are thinking of, of buying a new house or flat, that they get all the information they would need to be really incentivized actually to con just first consider um, uh, carrying out an energy renovation. Because sometimes you just don't think of it and you're just thinking, I'm, I don't have the budget, I just, I just want this flat there or this house there. But then if someone were, were to, you know, to tell them, okay, here is what we estimate, we, uh, ha we have an audit 
of, of this uh, building unit, this is what you could do and you would have um, a positive return after X years. And we could really take you by the hand, put you in contact with, um, with uh, relevant companies, contractors. I think that would be something that would be really useful, uh, really to address some of those you know, barriers to renovation. I really feel for this point, and it, it, it sounds a little bit like you've just been through a recent trauma of trying to renovate your home, <laughs> because yes. it is an ordeal. <laughs> I understand. Yes, Thank and you. I mean, even when you think of it in a theoretical way, you know, through legislation, just the fact of do, uh, trying to do it at your level, you really feel that there is still some, some way to go. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, there are two things that came to my mind. First of all, I think that's very close to what you were saying as well, but uh, I haven't gone through a, a big renovation myself, but we, some of us have, and we all know friends who have, and it seems really daunting. So even if I would love to do something about my highly energy inefficient building, I just don't dare. You know, um, because I don't know how much work it's going to imply and I don't have the knowledge and and what will it end up with and my my roof is already leaking is it going to be able to I mean I have all those kinds of questions and you might say that uh, that's nothing you just go ahead, but I I do find it's a matter of. Trusting that you will get what you think you're paying for as well in the end. Um, and I don't think that that is so obvious to, to all of us. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's one thing. That has nothing to do with, or it's not directly linked to legislation, but I think that's something that needs to be taken into account for us who are interested in, in improving our buildings to do so. Um, <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> Someone who has written a book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but also, uh, when it came to legislation, and, and you asked, what would you do in the coming, you know, uh, I understand your question as if I, if I, could, under, if I could decide myself, uh, and not caring about anything else, then I would indeed go ahead a bit like the Danes have done, and start to include um, uh, whole life carbon um, limit values. That would be my first thing to do. Sorry? One of the big leaders. Yes, I think so, yeah. I am renovating my house right now. <laughs> it's terrible <laughs> for many reasons, um, because the information is not always there. And I'm, I even know the information. Uh, the construction company is uh, not available because they have so many things to do, uh, because it's so difficult to upskill their workers. So it's many, many different reasons around the legislation that make it so hard and not the legislation itself. Um, uh, that said, of course, um having a good definition of quality is of course my ultimate goal to put in but um i'm also worried i mean um uh, in the next you see so many people i read yesterday in a newspaper that 20 uh, percent of people in belgium cannot afford their energy bill anymore so um i would really i mean that's also the plea that we try to make um do something for them that's the uh, one of the things why we are also there as the new european powers Yeah, indeed, and uh, you know, businesses are also on on life support now with uh, high energy prices and so on, and uh, supply chain problems. So, uh, individuals as well as businesses, especially SMEs. Um, coming back to the legislation thing, um, I think you know the Commission has put out the proposals for the PPD, the Construction Products Regulation, and a whole load of others. So that means that it's no longer in our hands. It's in the hands of the member state governments and council and the parliament. And um, so, uh, you know, we're not going to be changing the commission's proposals uh, unilaterally because they're already out. So, so it, it, the ball is in their court in, in a sense there. Um, I would also, you know, lay down a challenge to architects uh, to surprise us with their creative, creative responses. I think, uh, Peter, you showed a slide uh, right at the beginning of um, regenerative 
design and, and uh, buildings that actually have a positive impact on the environment. I think that's very challenging and, and I'd love to see buildings that have, for example, a positive impact on biodiversity. Um, that's not just putting some green roof on, but really, you know, what does that really mean? Um, and also a positive impact on, on resource consumption and, and these kind of things. Uh, I'd be fascinated to see uh, creative responses to that. And another thing that I think architects can do um, is, and I'd urge them all, uh, to be calculating and reporting their projects with levels and publishing the results on their own websites for the buildings that they design. And then, um, because the more data we have on results of, of these um, LCA calculations, the, the more data then we can use for policy making. So that would be really useful. Uh, well, challenge is accepted. I think that's a, that's a great takeaway. Also, I think for most of us in the in the uh, in, in 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 the hall and on following this offline uh, or online, uh, we are really the ones who are there to imagine and devise how can we actually deliver on these uh, goals. I think that uh, what has been really fant fantastic about the new European Bauhaus is that it's creating a democratic platform for participation really in uh, in in the uh, green transition and uh at least from the project that we are working on uh, together with uh, partners in italy and latvia uh, slovenia holland for the new european bauhaus we're really thinking about this i mean how can you actually create positive impacts and that's not just on site but also in the entire you know value chain and the supply chain, which is a really, really, really difficult task. And of course, we're not going to solve it in uh, the next couple of years, but we need to understand or we need to figure out ways of tackling problems at this scale. Uh, so challenge is accepted and uh, I really look forward to how this new European powerhouse will develop also with its demonstrators and the you know, potential frameworks that we can uh, create policies on. Judith? Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for these uh, excellent discussions and thanks for the uh, wonderful questions that we've had from the audience. I think this has been a really good discussion and I really look forward to uh, see how it goes. Hopefully all these initi initiatives that we, um, that is uh, on the agenda at the moment will not be watered down I think you can also tell the policy makers, I mean, the politicians, that there is really an industry, there's a construction sector that wants this to happen. Not everybody's on board, but really there's a majority of people who wishes strongly for this. And policy making is also market making. So I think that is really something to, uh, to push for. Also, when you go home to your respective countries, this is one thing that you can communicate as architects to policymakers in your local uh, environment that you create markets that enable the solutions to arrive when you really give us the hard you know, challenges. So thanks a lot to all of you and thanks to all of you uh, sitting in uh, your homes or in your offices uh, in Europe. Uh, here locally, we have drinks in a moment. So uh, thank you all very much.